Well, I'd first like to start by thanking Taste 3 and Gwen McGill in particular for getting me over here. And I'd particularly like to thank my wife for coming with me. Her support through my career has been fundamental in actually getting here. So today I'm going to talk about the re realities of wine and health and a slightly different tone to previous presentations. So keeping a healthy heart is the secret of a long, active life. And this is a, a heart scan taken one of, with some of the mo most modern technology that can be done in conscious people without any, any surgery or anything. We can look at the function of the heart. And all the time, cardiology, the diagnostics, the power of it's improving. We can see the vessels, we can see the disease. We can just get people to lay on a table. We can have a fly through through their coronary arteries and, and assess the state of disease within those arteries. Now, that's not open to everybody yet, but maybe one day it will be. But I don't think it's as simple as that. It's much more complicated, your, your heart health. Now, heart disease has generally been a silent process that you're completely unaware of. And with increasing age, from your healthy state in early life, there's a pro progressive appearance of lesions in your, in your vessel walls. And really, this is, this is something that is, is different in, in everybody. Depending on your risk factors, your genetics, your habits, the, these, this is a process that's affecting everybody in this room. And we will be at different stages depending on our uh, all, all these interacting factors. And I don't want to talk about these uh, life-threatening events and eventually the consequence we all worry about, but I want to talk about the fact that being healthy is about improving your lifestyle, improving what you do. The, the drugs and the in, in, interventions that cardiologists do, these are to manage disease and, and to, to prevent disease, but they're not as successful as what you can do in your, your diet and lifestyle. So the, the question after 25 years of research on, uh, on cardiovascular health was can wine really prevent heart disease? There's always lots of stories about it, but being a skeptical individual, I thought I, I ought to start looking into this in detail myself. Now, the background evidence for this was studies in, in the 1970s, 1980s and onwards that showed that in France you had a low heart disease and elsewhere and you had the highest consumption per, per head of population in the world of wine. Subsequent studies in, in Denmark and in eastern France covering about 60,000 people looked into their habits and looked at how much wine they were drinking and who was benefiting from that wine consumption and who was suffering the adverse consequences. And reached, there was a general conclusion, half a bottle a day might keep the doctor away. <laughs> but the questions as a scientist we needed to answer was how does wet red wine reduce heart disease? What is the protective component? Are all, all wines the same? And you have to also understand that there's been several suggested me mechanisms for how wine drinkers are protected from heart disease. Increased HDL cholesterol, that's protective cholesterol. Effects that prevent blood clots. Effects that prevent LDL oxidation. The drivers of, of atherosclerosis and coronary events. And more re recently, during the past 15 years, increasing evidence that wine can modulate blood vessel function. And this is really where I, ca I come in. We work on these cells that line the blood vessels. These are called the endothelium. Healthy endothelium protects you from heart disease. As soon as you damage your endothelium, you're at risk. Things like high blood pressure are one factor, smoking, diet, etc., etc. Now, we can culture these cells and study them in the lab and make various biochemical analyses to look at the effect of things like wine on, on blood vessel function. And in, in 2001, we published our first paper in this area. We looked at white and rosé wine, red grape juice, red wine, and we could show that we could suppress the pro-atherosclerotic changes that occur in the endothelium. Using this method, we can quantify the effect as an effective dilution, the, the concentration that will suppress these atherosclerotic changes by 50%. And you can see that red wine is already 
at least 20-fold more potent than red, red grape juice. So we could go on and quantify lots of wines. Uh, and you can see there's a correlation between the level of polyphenols in the wine and the activity of the wine. But there's, there's a, an information gap down here. Lots of biologically inactive polyphenols. And so we needed to work out what it was. And we tested various small molecules, and we showed that all of the molecules on this slide had virtually no effect in the amount that you found in wine. So any story you see on resveratrol, ignore it. it it's inappropriate. There's not enough resveratrol in wine to do anything for your health. We purified from wine the biologically active polyphenols and shown these to be a, a group of chemicals called procyanidins. For those who cognoscent of the area, these are the molecules in dark chocolate as well. So what I'm saying about wine is, is also relevant to dark chocolate. Now, <laughs> procyanidins are the main polyphenols in young wine, and they're there in wine and not in grape juice because it requires the alcohol to extract them during the fermentation process. And the levels depend on lots of different things, winemaker, et cetera, et cetera. And if you then plot procyanidins against their biological activity, you can see very clearly the, the correlation, and there's no information gap down the bottom here. Now, to ask, f to progress this further, I've, I'm a great believer a man is only as old as his arteries. If you've got the arteries of a 70-year-old when you're 40, you're not going to live very long. But if you've got the arteries of a 40-year-old of a when you're 70, then you can probably live to 100. And so, does wine consumption influence longevity in some parts of the world? And, and for these studies, I look first in Sardinia, and then in France. And I'm just going to briefly cover what I found in these areas. In Sardinia, they have an expression, akentanos, which literally means good health to 100 years. Now, you don't have an expression like that unless people are frequently living to 100, 100 years. <laughs> and in, in the central neuro province of Sardinia, there's virtually no difference in the number of centenarians between the men and women. Although the women, the female differences across Sardinia uh, 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 th there's really little difference. And that's the sort of level you get in most populations. So it's really the men in Sardinia, and that's typical of studies of, of wine, it's the men that benefit the most. So it was interesting for me to go to Sardinia and to take back samples of their wine to analyze in the lab. And it might be interesting to also note that these 112-year-olds are, are never far from a glass of something. And perhaps it's, perhaps it's the way they drink. I mean, this is a typical Sardinian wine bar. <laughs> now, the French used to gain their health information from the cover of their road maps. This is a 1933 road map. On the front, it says the average life expectancy is 59 for a wine drinker and 65 for a wa sorry, 59 for a water drinker and 65 for a wine drinker and 87% of centenarians are wine drinkers, so they've been aware of the importance of wine and health for, for several generations. <laughs> so I thought I'd better analyze French longevity, just to see whether I could pick up any trends. And I used the 99 census data to look at where the, the most number of men aged 75 were living. And it's, it's not in northern and eastern France. It, it's not really down the middle either. It's really just in the southwest, where you've got a preponderance of men living over, over 75. Now, in these areas, or in France in general, if you plot the average of, of the number, of the, the, the heart disease level in these countries, and the relative long, longevity, and you can see there's a correlation between longevity and heart disease, which is what you'd expect. About half of us will die of heart disease. Now, if you look at... Look further, you find that the, if you're in this quadrant here, you're, you have lower longevity and you have higher heart disease. And this is the beer and white wine drinking areas of the Northeast. If you look down here, you find that in the red wine areas, it's these people have living longer and have the, 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 the longest link, longevity with the lowest heart disease. So if we do further analysis of the people in, in southwest France, and we correct for the number of women of the same age in that area to make sure it's not because everybody decided to retire down there uh, to affect the average, 
You, you see there's a very clear pattern. One particular department, Gers, has a higher number of men aged over 75 th than the rest of France. Now, Gers is an interesting area. It's not close to Bordeaux. Toulouse is down here. It's a bit of in the middle of nowhere. The Pyrenees is to the south somewhere. Now, why should there be so many men aged 75 living in the Gers area? Well, interestingly, the wines of this area, Côte de Boulois, Côte de Saint-Mont, Madaron, these are all wines made with an unusual grape called the Tannat grape, which is a, which is a much more uh, tannic grape than Cabernet Sauvignon, although Cabernet Sauvignon on the scale of things is pretty, pretty potent. Th this, this is just exceptionally more potent. And if you look at the analysis of wines that I've done, over here, these are wines from the southwest France at least four times more potent than Aus Australian wines. These are your average from, from Spain, um, it Italy and France, South America, USA, and these are mainly Californian wines. This is the coastal Sardinian, and this is the inner, inner area of, of Sardinia. So a close relationship between people living longer and, more and wines that are more effective on blood vessel function. So I've written a book, The Wine Diet. It's not, not yet published in the in the States, but I've given um, wines in that book heart ratings from, from one, to, one to five on, on the, the analysis that we're able to do in the lab. And these are basically a relationship with the level of procyanidins, the active components in these wines. And we, we analysed 300 wines, excluding wines from southwest France, but 300 wines from across the world just to look at the procyanidin levels. And we found that almost 60% are in my 1 to 2 heart rating, with some actually scoring no hearts at all. These are just red alcoholic liquids. They've got no procyanidins. <laughs> <laughs> A third of them I put into this middle range, three hearts. That's pretty typical of a Napa Valley wine. And then 10%, the top 10% are 4 and 5 heart ratings. If you look at Madaron, this area in southwest France, 86% of those fall into this four and five heart rating. So you can see the difference. 10% on average in the world, 86% in this rating in that area. And you will be able to read more about it when this comes out in, in September, published by Avery. It's going to be called the Red Wine Diet now, but you'll learn about what, what I've been finding. So what are the factors that affect procyanin levels? The winemakers critically important. The decisions he makes will affect the type of wine he produces. The grape variety. It's, it's possible to make procyanidin and enriched wines from mo most grape varieties. But grape ripeness is critical. The, the riper the grape, the lower the procyanidin levels. And then, of course, there's, there's terroir, there's geography, the altitude, irrigation, all these other facts, factors that af affect the, the, the sort of astringency of the wines that come from those grapes. So this... this is, is an equation that the winemaker s s uh, pretty much sets the answer to. He wants re the result he likes, but it may or may not be a procyanidin-rich wine, depending on these factors. But I think there's an important message. I was talking about the early studies about wine and health, and a lot of these studies were using, looking at people drinking wine with 11 to 12 percent alcohol. Now we've got this current trend of longer hang time, greater grape ripeness, and actually wines are often getting stronger in a way that I think is not a good thing in terms of, of health. The more alcohol you consume, the more you're going to be at risk of the adverse consequences. It's not a simple equation drinking wine. You've got to get the balance right. Enough to be healthy, too much is bad. The other thing that concerns me is those early studies People were drinking wines that were made in a very traditional style, which tended to be higher in procyanidins. This style, higher alcohol, lower in procyanidins. So for two reasons, not, not a good choice. So I'd like us to go back towards a more traditional way of making wine to get these procyanidin-rich, lower alcohol wines. They're not good wines for sipping in front of the TV, but they're good wines for drinking with food. That's really about what this conference is about, wine and food. That's traditionally how wine was consumed. It's not something you just stand up in a bar and drink a bottle and then go home thinking you're, you've made yourself healthy. <laughs> we used to say half a bottle a day 
uh, three, four ounce glasses was a, a sensible level for a man to consume. But if we're drinking this level, we've got to actually cut it back and say less than half a bottle, two, four ounce glasses a day is what people should be considering as a healthy amount to drink. So, in summary, the beneficial effects we've identified on blood vessel function related to the procyanidin content of wine, and there's a good association between people drinking procyanidin-rich wine and greater longevity, suggesting that's a model we should, we should try and fit to closer in the future. Thank you very much.